has promised to show some code, so it should be exciting. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, my name is Stefano Rivera, and I hack on some Debian stuff, mostly Python related. Um, also, some Ubuntu things, I'll talk about that too. I just want to give you a general overview of a developer's introduction to Python, uh, to developer's introduction to Debian and Python and Debian. Um, so, this was a talk that I gave last year at PyCon and I've been parachuted in as an emergency speaker. So apologies if you heard this last year. I think I've removed the boring bits, um, but no one could remember it and tell me what they were. So maybe it was just entirely boring. We'll find out. Uh, let's start with some exercise. Um, has, who's heard of Debian? I hope to see all the hands raised. Good. Not quite there, but close. <laughs> um, and you use Debian? Uh, significantly less, and want to contribute to Debian? I, ah, that went up again, that's surprising. Um, and finally, actually contributing. So we've got two or three people who want to contribute and haven't contributed yet. I think we've got some work to do. Um, so, wh why Debian? What are we actually trying to achieve? Um, Free software on the whole is written by lots of little groups all over the place. And there's no central coordination. Um, so if you want a free software system on your computer, you have to put it together yourself or someone else has to do it for you. Debian tries to do that and create a holistic product, an operating system. Um, we call it the, our universal operating system because we don't really aim for any particular market or anything at all. Um, as an example of why this is useful, as a Linux person, if you've ever used OS X, the first thing you discover is where are all the utilities? Um, how do I get them? Why am I having to build all these millions of things from source? And where's my Linux machine? I want to go back to it. Maybe that's just me. So I think packages are kind of useful. Um, for a start, it saves me on build time, although as a Debian person, I spend half my time building packages anyway. Um, but it's not for me. So we, all these, um, free software projects out there, all have different build systems, and you don't want to have to deal with that nonsense when you want Bash on your machine. You just want to say, install Bash, please. So we solve that for you by building a by someone in Debian knowing how that's supposed to be built and building a package for you that you just install. You know, Bash also depends on libc and some other things. It, we take care of that. You probably knew that if you knew what Debian was. Um, we release about once every two years and support them releases for about three years. Then there's a new thing called long-term support, which you probably come across if you know about Ubuntu. There's a little sponsored group of people who are trying to um, maintain old Debian releases for five years after release date. So, what is a release? We are continually taking the latest versions of everything that these free software communities are producing, and if we think they're good, we include them. And every two years, because roughly every two years we release, we take a snapshot of the entire world, fix all the really egregious bugs, and call it a release. Sometimes that bug fixing process can take a while, which is why Debian has a reputation for being a bit old. Um, but hopefully we're getting better and better and producing a reliable, frequent releases that are frequent enough to be useful. So I said I was going to talk about the developer's perspective to Debian. How does Debian function? Um, it's made up of maintainers of packages. I describe it as being feudal. Um, there are thousands of people involved in Debian and they're all responsible for their own little corners of Debian. And they have complete control over that, their corners. They can be overridden by the leadership in extreme situations, but that almost never happens. Um, but on the whole, you rise to your, you gain control of your little corner of the world, your fiefdom, through meritocracy. If you are good at what you're doing and you do it, people will give you responsibility, as much as you'll take until you hang yourself. <laughs> um, so on the whole, packages are maintained by people who are experts in them and know a thing or two about the thing they're working on. This isn't entirely true. There are some crazy people who maintain hundreds of packages and don't actually know anything about any of them. Um, but that's a bit of an unhealthy situation, and over time it should work out itself out. The path through Debian, if you're a contributor to the project, is initially 
when no one knows who you are. If you produce some good work, someone else will sponsor it and upload it into your project, like making a pull request in GitHub and someone reviewing it and saying, yeah, that looks sensible, I think we're gonna have that. Um, once you've been doing that for a while and people are getting tired of reviewing your work, then they'll say, please stop buzzing, buggering me with um, review requests. I'm just gonna give you upload rights to that package because clearly you know what you're doing. I haven't had to help you in the last while. You're on top of this. Um, and after a while they say, well, I don't even want to restrict that to just a particular package. You're gonna have complete upload rights to whatever you want to. Don't piss other people off, they won't like it. Uh, uh, and so we have about a thousand develop Debian developers in the project who have the ability to do whatever they want, but they don't because that would piss people off. Um, we have a couple of hundred Debian maintainers, something like that, and an unknown number of people who are vaguely involved in the edges of the project and getting uploads sponsored by Debian developers. Uh, there is also a, another path through the project for non-developers, although at a Python conference I assume most of you are developers. Um, we have a concept of non-uploading Debian developers, which is a very poor term, but now we kind of call them members. So it gives you all the voting rights that a Debian developer has in our uh, leadership structures, but without any upload rights, which makes a lot of sense if you're involved in the community but don't need the security. We don't need the extra security risk in the project of giving you unfettered upload rights, which you're never going to exercise. Um, there are also a lot of teams because we don't all work on our own. So there's a particularly big team for Python stuff called the Debian Python's module team. And there's another one for Python applications. There's a big overlap between the two. Um, we hang out in an IRC channel and work on Python stuff together. If you want to get involved in Debian stuff, this is a very good place to start because there are a large number of knowledgeable people there and they'll be willing to help you along your way. Um, I said I was gonna talk about Ubuntu a bit. Some of you who don't use Debian probably use Ubuntu. It's pretty much Debian. Um, it's a downstream of Debian. Every, well, it, they, they take an opinionated stance as well. So the Ubuntu CD contains what the Ubuntu developers think are a good experience on a CD. If only the important things and everything you need. Well, everything you need to do a small amount of things. Um, this is a useful thing to do because you're less choice. Uh, choice takes time. Why? If there's an obvious right solution, why should you have to choose for yourself when you, someone can just tell you you should use that thing? Uh, on the whole, it's entirely unmodified Debian. Um, it's about 75% or 70% unmodified. I think about 15% modified and the rest is entirely new other stuff like Unity. On the whole, it, it's maintained by a much smaller number of people than Debian. Debian's got thousands of people involved. The core Ubuntu, the sort of Ubuntu equivalent of Debian developers is maybe about 100 people versus 1,000 in Debian. Um, and a similar release cycle releases every two years with five years support, except there's also those little releases every six months. Um, it's a little bit different because people, many people in the Ubuntu project are being paid to work on it if they work for Canonical. And that means that there are places where they can get ahead of Debian because, well, if you've got your day job this week is to make this big thing happen, you go and make it happen. Um, and you will send those patches back to Debian, but you don't have the authority to mess with all those people's fiefdoms on Debian because it's feudal. Um, so it can take a lot longer for things to happen. So, we package Python and Debian. The interpreter, you probably use that if you use Debian, if you use Ubuntu. Um, yeah, I said that. And we have Python 3, and these days Python 3 is probably the preferred Python, especially in Ubuntu. Um, and I maintain PyPy in Debian because I'm a little bit crazy. Um, it's not particularly useful yet, maybe in a few years it'll be. Why do we have Python and Debian? Um, there are applications that are written in Python that are kind of useful to our users. So we package some of those. Uh, we can try and keep them out of the way. That's a technical detail, don't know why I've got that there. We also package libraries. Now you're gonna ask, 
why do you need a Python pa library package in Debian? Because you are a developer, you use virtual names, what is all this library package nonsense? And that's a fair response. Um, if you're a developer, it's virtual names are probably the way to go. There, was, there were some reasons why libraries are useful, though, like for those applications. Some of them need depend on libraries. And some of the libraries are, are really painful to build. Things are improving there, but many of the C things don't build too easily. And it's kind of convenient to just have to get install a package rather than figure out how to build a thing. Um, yeah, C extensions. So it can be convenient. The big difference is because Debian is taking the entire world every two years and snapshotting it as a release, there's only one version of every library in Debian. So if you're depending on SQL Alchemy 8 and Debian has SQL Alchemy 9, tough. You're going to have to use a virtual env, or you're going to have to port your code to whatever version Debian has. There's one funny little difference, well, there are a few funny little differences. The most obvious one between a sort of standard C Python that you build for yourself from the Mercurial checkout and the Python we have in Debian, which is we change the site packages directory to be called dist packages. The history for that is simply so that you can build your own Python from Mercurial and install the two side by side and they won't mess with each other's libraries. But it does call it, cause a little bit of breakage here and there. Um, I was going to talk about the history of Python and Debian. I think I've ripped most of the section out of the slides because it's fairly boring. In the past, we were violating PEP20 badly. There used to be many ways of packaging Python stuff in Debian and it was horrible. This is obviously not how Python is supposed to work. You've all done read the Zen of Python. You know that there should be one and only one way to do things. So we have that. It's called PyBuild. Um, it's now usable, so you should use it if you do any Python stuff in Debian. Uh, I'll come back to exactly how you use it in a bit. I mentioned this. I said we have teams that do um, maintain packages. We, to collaborate, obviously, we use version control um, to share our work. And sadly, at the moment, that's all subversion, but we're working on migrating that to Git. Maybe by the time you get involved, we'll have done that. Uh, we, there was some progress at DebConf last month. Um, I, if, you in, if you want to get involved, I say join. Yes, there's a URL. Come and help us fix bugs. Or, rev or review things. If you don't have anything particular that you want to work on, there's always other things that other people have done that needs review. We all know as developers, the usually the biggest um, shortfall in resources, people with time for reviewing. And we... As a community, if I'm trying to recruit people, we need less people to do packaging and more people to do other things, like infrastructure and wrangling people. Uh, a lot of Debian is... We've been around for a while and we're quite good at what we do, but maybe it's not obvious to other people. It's all kind of complicated and we understand it and we haven't told other people. We could use um, new blood to help with that kind of problem. When you're stuck in the world for too long, you stop realizing what it's like to join it. Um, if you're an upstream library maintainer who is interested in interacting with Debian, what advice can I give you? Um, it's kind of helpful to talk to whoever's packaging your library in Debian. If it is being packaged, if it isn't, that can be you. Then there's no need for communication and it's all easy. Um, if they've got a team, join it. Read, to their, read their bugs, then you know the kind of things that are causing them trouble and you can discuss what needs to happen. Often our perspective on how things should work or be packaged is different to upstream developers because we've got different goals. Provide stable APIs if you can. This is kind of a no-brainer. If you're maintaining a library, provide a stable API and have patience and deal with people. Um, so as someone spanning these two communities, the Python and Debian communities, the kind of questions I usually get from people who don't know Debian are, why is everything so ancient? Um, some of it is because people didn't have time and they had lives, they had children, they had whatever. Um, and a release came around and they were too busy to package the latest version of the package. But the old one they had was probably fine. It just misses the feature you want. Um, you can help with that, but it means being involved before the release goes out. We 
once we've released, we can't package all the latest crack because then it wouldn't be a stable release anymore. There's a <laughs> stability and change don't go hand in hand. Um, another problem is that pack people weren't, mm -hmm. they got so busy that they kind of got disinvolved from the project and they need someone else to take over from them. Um, in general, you can just do that. If something is pissing you off because it is so out of date, come and help. So, I said I was going to talk about how things actually work. Um, Debian packaging. Most people who work in outside of packaging think of packaging as a really boring thing that has to happen to make, to distribute your work, but otherwise don't really want to get involved in it. Um, it can get messy and complicated, and it's not really anything to do with you building your library. How do we do it? At the heart, a Debian package is the upstream release, so you maintain your library, you release a tarball with version 1.0 of your library. The Debian maintainer grabs that tarball and adds some metadata to it and some patches to it. Um, so if there were bugs that have to be fixed or if there are changes that have to be made to fit into Debian, we have patches. And we have metadata like dependencies and how to actually build the thing. Um, then we take this package, which was the source package, and we run it through our build system and we get some binary packages. Sometimes one, sometimes more than one. Uh, this can be a little bit confusing until you're used to this world. Because we mostly, as a user, you mostly deal with the binary packages. As a developer, you mostly deal with the source packages. Um, but how do we build them? Let me show you some examples. Uh, do I have to get out of this? I think I press F. And we just lose everything. No, not, not entirely. Um, Here's a really cryptic looking make file. Now most of you probably think that make is cryptic to start with, and then we use the percent very well, yeah, not variable, rule, wildcard rule that matches everything, and DH, which means something, and you pass it a parameter, and you say with some things, build system, high build. Um, think of this as legacy glue. It's a way of, in the olden days, we used to have a make file in every Debian package that said this is how you build the package and it was 200 lines long and it had every step that needed to be done. Um, and as you can imagine, 200 lines of boilerplate in 30,000 packages means a lot of maintenance overhead whenever we want to change something. If we decide, you know, actually, we think that when we put change logs there, they should go there. Now we've got to change all 30,000 packages, that's a bad idea. Um, so over time, we have automated more and more of this to get to the point with this tool called DH, which stands for Deb Helper. And if you say build system pi build, that tells it this thing is a Python package, figure out what you need to do and build it like a Python package. Um, and when you're finished building it, run the helper for Python 2, the helper for Python 3, and the helper for PyPy. Um, and that pretty much gives you a working package. There's a little bit more metadata. So we have a control file that says this package is, the, so the source package is unid code. Um, we have sections in here, don't need to know any of this stuff. Who the maintainers are, as said, um, feudal system. What we need to build it, we need Deb Helper, that's where the DH comes from. And we need some Pythons because we probably need to run set up a Py build, so we're going to need some Python. What versions of Python it's going to work with. Um, some more metadata. And then the binary packages we're building. So you've probably seen Python libraries are called Python hyphen thing, which is normally the upstream library name. Well, it's the, the, the name you import. And a description. It's all really very simple. Uh, then there's the same thing but for PyPy, and the same thing but for Python 3. It's a little bit irritating that you have to repeat all of this, but it's the way things work. We have a change log that tracks all the changes. You probably have this for your upstream library anyway. Um, every upload to the archive has a change log entry. And we have a copyright file because as you might have heard Debian's quite pedantic about licensing. Um, 
when we distribute 30,000 packages, we need to make sure that we can legally distribute them and that you can do what... Hmm. You can copy them and give them to your friends and, you know, the four freedoms of software. You can't necessarily exercise all four with the entire Debian archive, but close on it. Um, so we keep track of the licensing and copyright of everything. Uh, that's probably the most onerous part of package maintenance in a complex package. Um, so what does this do? You run the build command and it goes and does some stuff. If I scroll up, you probably recognize most of this output as being the kind of thing you would see from running setup.py, build and setup.py install. Oh god, this is a verbose library. Uh, does it even, no, this, I'm not running it verbose enough to tell us what it's doing, oh well. Point is, if we get to the end, it's spat out some binary packages. We can see the uh, three here that it's spat out, the Python one, the PyPy one, and the Python three one. Um, and we can see that they contain the kind of things we'd expect it to contain. User lib, Python, dist packages, bunch of stuff you know, pi files, kind of thing that a package is made up of. Right, enough of that. Let's go to some more fun, complex examples. Um, automation is fantastic, you can solve the common case, but you're always going to need some manual overrides for the more complex cases. Here is a library that needs to be tested with um, PyTest and it needs two arguments to PyTest. So I use pretty much the same rule that you saw there before, and I have an extra override saying when you test it, this is what you should run. You should run the Python interpreter that we're testing for, and these are the arguments. Um, and then we're building debug packages, so there's a bit of extra complexity there. That could probably be automated out at some point. Um, otherwise, this looks pretty much the same as before. It's got a lot more build dependencies, and it spits out about the same number of binary packages. Right. Enough of that. Where were we? Waiting for projectors to resync. Um, guess what? I've covered most of this. PyBuild runs setup.py for all the Python stacks, yes. And it knows about all the common unit testing systems and plugs into DH. And we've looked at examples. So, we need people, and some of you wanted to get involved, so please do. Come and talk to me, or come and join our mailing list, or go to that link I mentioned. That one. Um, and now a little digression. There are a few of us here trying to organize a bid for DebConf 16 in Cape Town because DebConf is a f fairly fun, conf very developer-centric conference that I've enjoyed it many times in other countries and every time I go and introduce myself to, one of the, to someone in one of these and they say, where are you from? I'm from South Africa. Ooh, when are we gonna have a DebConf there? So I think it's time to, for it to happen. Um, we want to hosted in Cape Town in 2016. We're currently busy looking for venues, and we're trying to build a team of people that are gonna make this happen. Um, so far, we've got about 10, 15 people. Eventually, we're going to need about that number, but I expect people to drop out along the way. Um, but it's a conference of about 200 to 300 people, so it's going to need a reasonable amount of organization and sponsor wrangling and usual conference organizing stuff, so come and help us out. We need to submit a bid in December. If we picked, we then need to host it in maybe August 2016 or something like that. Come and hang out on our IRC channel or chat to us about it. 
Right. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? That's a very half-hearted hand raising. <laughs> it's not a good. It's not a good question. So it's kind no, of. So I wanted to find out um, if you're releasing every two years. Yeah. And I'm assuming there's a freeze and then like a testing phase with bug fixes. How long is that freeze? Um, until we fix the bugs. Okay. How long do you plan <laughs> for the? Is it like? Is it really like? There's no. It has been about as long as a year in the past. We never want that to happen. It's been longer than a year, and um, we never want that to ever happen again. So we're working on making it shorter and shorter. And the expectation this year is that it's going to be down to a couple of months. Okay. And then, uh, if that's the case, why don't you just freeze, wait for stable release, and then do it all over again? You, immediately. Yeah, I mean, take a month off or something, but like, <laughs> you know, we, you're not busy. We need all the crack to land on the archive before we can freeze again. I mean, all, uh, the, all the new crack that's happened has to um, be uploaded and... Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of work to happen in between. Um, so our approach to really long freezes and slow release times has been to kick out packages that have serious bugs. So now if your package has a really release critical bug, before the freeze, it's going to be pulled out of the testing branch. Uh, I never described Debian release branches. We upload the new crack to a thing called unstable. What is crack? Crack. I'll, I'll cover that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, whenever upstream projects release new things that we package in Debian, um, when we think those are ready, we upload, we upload them to the, sta to the unstable suite in Debian. It's called unstable because it's where all the new stuff goes. In practice, it's not that unstable. Um, then there's an automatic process that takes things that have proven themselves to be stable and moves them into a suite called testing. And that is, going, that is what is going to become the next release when we freeze. The next freeze is due in November. Um, I find if you're a developer, running testing is actually a pretty good thing to run on your laptop because you get fairly current software plus some stability. It's what I run. Um, many Debian developers run unstable because it's that's what we're building against. So what we're trying to do now is um, if a package turns out to have release critical bugs, we pull it out of testing so it's simply not going to be there when we release. And unless they fix the, if they fix the bugs, they can get back in. If they don't tough, you're not going to hold things back. That doesn't work if you really call a package like Grub, but we can make some exceptions. H has that happened with Grub? What? I mean, has it happened where you, Grub? where there was a serious bug in a core package and it delayed everything? Almost every bug in Grub is release critical because being able to boot your machine is kind of important. Um. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Yes. So those v the very core packages get a lot of release critical bugs and fixing them is hard. And it's at I, that's now going to be the um, main cause for a, the freeze to take as long as it'll take. Okay. Any other questions? Really, the other end. Okay. Um, are you going to be running any sort of packaging tutorial at the sprints? Sure. If anyone wants any help with packaging anything, come and talk to me. Or if there's something in Debian that's broken and you want it to be less broken and you think you might know how to do it, I'm very keen to help you make that happen. Cool. I have a question. It actually came out of the previous presentation where, um, where the presenter asked a very, uh, very interesting question. Her question was, do you remember your first year of programming? Um, to, well, first she asked how many people have been programming for five years and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And then she asked, do you remember your first year? So my question to you is, when did you first run Debian? What do you remember of your first year with Debian? And what would your recommendations be for people getting into Debian with the, with the desire to see them grow into the position where you are now? Um, if I look back on it, I was quite close to growing into the into the development community back then, and I just didn't. Um, I should have done that. But let me, let's take a step back. 
I started with Debian around, maybe around 2002, 2003. I'd just gone through an R, through a RPM hell with Red Hat. Um, <laughs> and I never wanted to do that again, and people told me this wasn't a problem in Debian. So I tried it and I got cooked. Um, <laughs> At that time, the AMD 64 port was being brought up, and I was on the mailing list there, chatting and almost getting involved, and then something happened, and I lost interest. Um, if I'd pushed through... I'm now a more mature person. I think I'm useful to the... It's useful to the project to have some experience with development, but it's also useful to have um, young green blood with people who have free time and haven't had it all sucked up by other things in their life yet. Those kind of people can make enormous changes to an open source project if you can recruit them early. Um, so if you, think, if you think this is something that interests you, you don't have to have the technical skills. If you just have a desire to make a difference, people will listen to you and help you make that difference. We're just looking for people with the drive to make it happen. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do that just to make him walk? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I have, I have what I think is an interesting question. In the sort of modern world where, like, the latest iOS update came out and it was, you know, installed seven bajillion times in seven hours, um, and everybody's sort of the new hot thing, you know, people are upgrading their phones just because they want the latest firmware or the latest version of Android. And then we have Debian, which is like kind of the antithesis of all of that. Um, is there, like, what is the future of Debian beyond, beyond nerds who just are angry at instability and just want that? Because it seems like it's a very small niche and it's, I don't see it growing. And, and, and I'm not sure if it is. Um, it's growing in different areas to where it used to. I describe Linux distributions as not being cool anymore. When we were young, it was, when I was young, <laughs> um, it was where the fun was. Now, I don't need to learn how to use Vim and bash scripting to use my computer. Um, I can buy a MacBook and click on pretty icons and look at cat pictures. Um, I don't even need to compile a kernel. It's crazy. Um, but Debian and Ubuntu are now growing in the cloud space. If you're running our office, everyone uses MacBooks except me, and all of our production infrastructure runs on Ubuntu. And I think that's a fairly common thing in the startup world. Um, but that does mean that we're becoming a niche because there are less and less ops people around. Developers are now people who can write JavaScript um, in a very pretty text editor on a Mac, and they've never learned Unix. And that's not a bad thing. Unix is very cryptic, and it's going to take you many decades to master. Um, so we are going to become more niche. I, I don't know what Debian as a project does about that. So far, we've continued to attract like-minded people, but we haven't been growing significantly. <laughs> no, this is an, a thought that I've had for a while now. Um, I'm, I'm going to disagree with your sort of bleak picture. Thank um, you. <laughs> I think in a way, open source projects and especially Linux are already bad at claiming victory. And I mean, in, beyond the cloud space, Linux is basically what runs on every new Android tablet and phone that is coming out. And I think, as in slide yesterday, 25 billion more devices, almost all of those are going to run Linux. And they're not going to be shiny interfaces. They're going to be just the computers that are everywhere. And probably Debian has a big place there because when your toaster is running Linux or running some operating system, you don't want it to have a shiny interface. Well, at least it has a shiny interface, but it's, that shiny interface is very custom. And 
the stuff below it, you just want to work. So if your toaster only gets like a new firmware upgrade or new kernel upgrade every two years, maybe that's fine. Um, and the toaster is maybe a, a silly example, but actually um, people's smartphones are already toasters. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of serious. They're, they're toasters. They're actually a suite of kitchen application of appliances. <laughs> you can just download like toaster 3.0 onto your base phone and it will allow you like measure the number of steps you take or um, do some other very small custom things. So there's, there's a kind of middle ground where you can have a very stable base layer um, where Debian, I think, fit in really well. And then you have apps or browser plugins or something which provides you with the, the, the crack. Ab absolutely. Um, I had a point. I think as a hacker, I want to create more hackers like me. And those things aren't going to do that immediately. Um, my first computer, you had it booted to a basic prompt, and if you wanted to play a game, you had to first write a game. Um, that's not what it's like for current generations, and it's going to, it's people, people are going to be less likely to discover that path of entry into development. And I, I think I'm fine with that. Um, and yes, Debian is an important base of <laughs> many consumer products. Um, was cr cr Chromebook originally based on Ubuntu? I, it's certainly bits of Ubuntu. Now I think it's a custom Gen 2 thing. But if you build, we claim to be the universal operating system or to aim to be the universal operating system. If you, if you build something that universal, it can be used as the base for anything. And yes, Debian does definitely have a future as that. I'm just a little bit worried that it's going to be too under the hood and not going to be attracting um, enough young blood. But that changes. Raspberry Pi, as an example, is a fantastic way for people to, they come with Debian, and it's a great way for people to see under the hood and get involved. Cool. Um, I have one more question, if no one else has. Hi. Um, my question would be, why would we you advocate people to choose Debian over like other distros for Linux? Because like you can still get your rolling releases and get the shiniest new stuff while still being active in the Linux community and open source. Absolutely. Um, so sure, pick pick what works for you. We're all part of the same community. Um, we sometimes compete with each other a little, but on the whole, anything that's good that one group does will be adopted by other people. After all, we're producing free software. It's free to share, free to use. I, I said on the first slide that one of my hats is an Ubuntu developer. These days, I'm a fairly inactive Ubuntu developer, but I also see that as a perfectly reasonable choice of operating system to make. And if you, are, if you want to make extreme customizations to your system, a source-based system is probably a very good choice. I can see why people like Arch or Gentoo. Um, but if you want something reproducible that has very high quality in many different non-standard configurations, Debian can be very good at that. The community of Debian developers is diverse and we do cr we're all doing crazy things with it. I think that makes it a very strong system. Cool. So um, one question from me. If so I, I I had a conversation earlier today or yesterday about how, how, how GitHub as a tool makes it so much easier for anyone who's l interested in software development to start off as an open source developer, right? Yeah. It's, it's easier nowadays to start in open source software than actually in closed software, just because of the whole ecosystem, right? If someone is interested in, uh, like I write software, yeah. but pretty much all the stuff I do goes straight to, I just write pip pip installable stuff, right? If I would want to grow into maintaining Debian packages, what would be, not exactly the GitHub, but what would be the GitHub kind of thing that, I, that you would point me at to make it easier for me to release stable open source packages for, um, for Debian than for anything else? And if that's... And if the answer is that thing is missing, that's a perfectly valid answer to as well. To some degree it is. Um, 
Debian takes a very opinionated stance on the infrastructure we use. So we won't encourage people to use GitHub because GitHub is non-free software and we stand strongly on our Debian free software guidelines which say that we want to use free software that you can all modify and share in your, your FSF for freedoms. Um, so our tools can be very developer-centric and you need to know what you're looking for to know how to find it. Um, we are working on making this better. There is a site called mentors.debian.net, which isn't particularly user-friendly, but it's the, it's, the GitHub, it's the pull request place for Debian. If you have prepared a new package and you want someone to upload it, you put a copy on Mentors and you send a link to someone saying, well, you file a bug in the request for sponsorships um, section of our bug tracker and someone will come and have a look, hopefully soonish. Um, this isn't the pretty point and click interface you see on GitHub. It's very email driven and command line driven, but that's the kind of people we are. And I think as a project, we're looking for people to implement more user-friendly solutions for people to get started. Excellent. Looking forward. Okay. Is there any other questions? Otherwise, we're just going to wrap it up. Cool. Another round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>